It's our pleasure to have with us Rajmohan Gandhi for this idea exchange, who of course needs very little introduction for all of us. But let me add that this idea exchange is also occasioned by the publication of his latest work, uh, Modern South India. It's, it's a very comprehensive work and it kind of fills a vacuum in historiography. Um, so the format is uh, uh, something like this. If you could begin with an introductory remark and then we take questions or you could, we could go on to questions right away. Let's go to questions straight away. Why bore, why bore all of you? <laughs> to begin with the book, a history from the 17th century, uh, modern South India history from the 17th century to our times. Um, a lot of the conventional histories of modern India don't really begin from this, the, the 17th uh, century. century. Uh, uh, so would you, would you just... Uh... Yes, so certainly modern South India or modern India or modern any part of India is a phrase to which different people may give different meanings. And there is no accepted uh, date for the start of the modern period of Indian history. I had been aware for a long time that the South was not uh, well represented in history writing. Uh, so nothing of South India as a whole has featured prominently uh, in uh, history books. Uh, so there was an obvious need to do it. And this I was, I was aware of for some time. But the practical trigger that began this research and book was uh, the, my publisher asking me to write on this. Uh, and uh, I, I, I felt it was something that was necessary. And in a very partial way, since I had done some, um, I had done Rajaji's biography, so I had re researched something about one or two periods of modern South India already. Um, but that was, I know, very limited. But I had some limited experience in this area. Sir, since you are talking about uh, South India as a whole, I mean, this is something that I am curious about. Uh, in the recent political uh, developments, you can see South India is some kind of cut off from what is happening in the north. So the the the, the ruling party is not able to make much inroads in the south. Is there any historical reason for that, or is it is it because the way the North Indian parties, if I can call them, are looking at the southern politics and the history and the traditions and even the psyche? Thank you. Uh, I have tried to, to uh, very, very briefly towards the end of this book, because I bring the book up to uh, this year, 2018, uh, I asked the question, why is it that the BJP has not had much success in the South? I recognized, I acknowledged the reasonable success the BJP has had in Karnataka. Um, but nonetheless, the broad uh, assessment that BJP has had very limited success in the South was true. So uh, my own uh, analysis suggests something like the following. Uh, so there have been, say, in the last 150 years, some great movements in the South. There was the movement for Indian independence. There was the movement for social justice. Uh, there was the movement for democratic rights in the princely states. Um, so, uh, they, in, in, there were great movements against untouchability. If we can distinguish that from social justice, I mean, they are related, but they are, you may see them as two distinct movements. In none of these movements, the BJP or its predecessors had any significant role. That is one large reason why the BJP did not have a, a good uh, start in the South. Secondly, because of the preponderance of 
Brahmins and Hindi speakers in the RSS. Uh, that was also a block for them in the South. But still, the divide politically is getting wider. And do you think, because you know, at least you know, maybe a minor section people started talking about the South as a uh, another you know uh, uh, a group of uh, states as a country, like when the um, finance commission's issue came up, some even finance ministers started a southern um, coordination between the southern states. So, uh, do you think the kind of policies, the kind of ideology, which is actually getting prominence and you know much talked about in India, is uh, is uh, going to be dangerous for India as a whole? Like, if we I can talk about north and south, like including west, the uh, the north being included, the west and east. So let me try to answer your important question in the following way. One, the ideology of intolerance, of compulsion, of zabardasti. I, I think zabardasti is, a, is a, the right word, one of the right words for what's we know, coercion. Uh, that ideology is offensive to all parts of India and people all across India. So that is not particularly offensive only to the South. That is a, a broad understanding I have of India as, as a whole. But there is undoubtedly a uh, feeling all across the South that much of the BJP-related politics is North India-centered, is neglectful of, of the South. Uh, but I, I do uh, uh, raise this, this question. That in today, say from 2014, who are the Southern political figures who are influential in Delhi? Venkaya Naidu is definitely from the South. But does he represent a very powerful political force in either Andhra or Telangana? Not to my understanding. Nirmala Sitaraman is also, a, she is a defense minister, first woman defense minister, which is impressive. But she's not there in parliament or in government because of her political strength. You know, she has come from Rajya Sabha in two different states. Uh, so, there is no political figure in the present dispensation that represents a very large southern constituency. And in fact, if you take that further, even among the bureaucrats, you know, there was a time when then so, so many South Indian bureaucrats in very influential positions. Even that seems to have, I've not made a very careful study of uh, the bureaucracy and its linguistic components. But the impression is that the South, which earlier had a larger share, than now does not have. So yes, in the last four, four or five years, the impression has gained ground that the South has lost the kind of voice it used to have in Delhi. There is this, you know, uh, the present dispensation, Mr. Modi also constantly talks about Bara Sosal. There is this kind of marker as so far as history is concerned, that you know, it's after 1200 years that we've been liberated. So it, it's never been clarified politically by the top leadership what they refer to when they say Bara Sosal. Are they referring to the Shankaracharya, you think? This other very um, unifying and divisive force uh, which... Um, uh, uh, formation of uh, thought, <laughs> which churns out these ideas and phrases across uh, from time to time. Their great strategy is never to speak directly and leave it to people to make their guesses. And they know that a great many people uh, will make the, draw the conclusion they want them to draw. In my understanding, the conclusion they want people to draw from it is, ever since the Muslims came to India, uh, when did Ghazni come? No. No, Ghazni came in the 11th century. Islam comes earlier, in Sindh it comes earlier. Yeah. So it is, yes, ever since Islam came, sort of India has become a slave country. That is their, their notion. Now, uh, so, uh, you know, people speak of Hindutva, hard Hindutva, soft Hindutva, uh, Congress is Hinduizing itself, etc., etc., etc. But this discussion misses a very simple, clear point. 
what is the difference between the ideology of this lot and the rest of us? The ideology of this lot and the ideology of Gandhi, of Nehru, of Patel, of Subhash Bose, of Tagore, of, of so, so, so many others. Raja Ji, who, who also features in this book, who wrote about the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Raja, Raja Ji knew a heck of a lot about Hinduism. The difference between hard Hindutva and soft Hindutva is only this. The Hindutva that contains nafrat of Muslims is one thing, and nafrat of Christians. The difference is not to be found in the degree of devotion to Hinduism, on the number of temples of Hindus that you visit. That stark difference is, in one case, you are promoting dislike of Muslims and Christians, except in the Northeast, where you want to mobilize the Christians also against the Muslims. And the other Hindus, whether it is Gandhi or whether it is uh, Patel, Nehru, Tagore, I mean, and the people of India, the broad people of India who have loved their uh, Muslim saints also, uh, and they don't want this dislike of, of, of Muslims. So, uh, this division of India into the, and this some judge has spoken in Assam, I think, today. <laughs> so that is, uh, I think that is a very, not just unfortunate, but a, a destructive divide, which will really hurt our life in this country. Sorry. Uh, how has the history of South India, or the recent history of South India, affected their worldview. And I'm coming from a fact because a lot of people now say in Delhi that, you know, if Punjabi should not be handling Indo-Pak relations, it should actually be South Indians handling Indo-Pak relations because they would go up without any emotions and handle it well. Uh, my question was much larger than that. How has the worldview been affected? Is it more sea-centric? Is it more trade-centric? Uh, then being more, more, more military-centric? And, and what is the, uh, how has the history affected it? The South has had Muslims much before the North had Muslims, even before almost the same time as Sindh had some Muslims. So, and as you alluded, the fact that the South, the peninsula, is more governed by the oceans than North India, which is governed by the Himalayas. So this is a geographical, very stark difference between the two regions, which has implication trade, contact with the outside world. So that has definitely and, and then don't underestimate. Now, no, there, is, there is, on the one hand, the Dravida ideology, and Periyar is a very important factor, and he also features in this book. But in addition to the Dravida ideology, or in fact related to the ide Dravida ideology, are one or two very interesting thoughts in the culture of the South about everybody being a single community. And of course, this book that many have heard of, though not many have read, the Kural, is an absolutely incredible book. The kind of uh, wisdom it has about human relations, family relations, political relations, I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, but then there is this other thought, which I will also read to you, which is very much part of the legacy of the South. Yadamuru Yavaram Kelir. All towns are one to us, all people are our kin. All towns are one to us, all people are our kin. This was said almost 1800 years ago. So, this notion that your neighbor is your kin, whatever his or her faith may be, is a tremendous thought which is still nurtured in many hearts. Of course, it's nurtured also in the south and the, in the north and the east and the west. But it, it is there as a very real thing in the south. So this, too, is a very hope-giving factor for the future of India. Sir, in the name, uh, and sir, in the name of you talked about Nehru and Patel, since you're by the first Patel. Now, there's also this push to this narrative that uh, 
in the of denigrating Nehru and projecting Patel in the new dispensation. So how do you look at this historical figures being uh, projected in these ways of politics? Uh, to suggest that Patel and Nehru were kind of enemies, that they proposed contrary um, paths for India, that their visions for India clashed, is so untrue. And, uh, um, you know, that, and the idea that, you know, Gandhi f f forced Nehru on India when all of India was wanting Patel. I mean, let these people produce from 1945, 46, 47, 48, one news item in any local language in any part of India, unhappiness that Patel was not made prime minister. I, 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 let them produce one document suggesting that anyone in India said Nehru should not be prime minister, Patel should be prime minister. Yes, in later years, many things happened. Indira Gandhi came, emergency came, and Indira Gandhi's sins were then you know, projected backwards into and yes, people were critical of Jawaharlal Nehru on many issues, and rightly so. But this uh, suggestion that there was Patel and all the people of India wanting him to be the leader, and Jawa Mahatma Gandhi came and then foisted Jawaharlal Nehru on an unwilling India. When an uh, American journalist uh, went, this is a 49, in Bombay to a meeting, and met Patel after the end of a big public meeting, Patel said to him, he's, the journalist talked about the big, big crowd that had come, so Patel said, they came for Nehru, not for me. And in October of 1950, two months before he died, Patel made this absolutely categorical public statement that the decision to make Nehru was absolutely right. Everybody has seen now the light of rise in India, the Hindu right. And given the kind of vote share it has commanded, despite its limited uh, geographical spread in only North India, North of India primarily, <coughs> it shows that, that in large tracts of India there was such a depth in voters' depth. <coughs> As a historian, why did we not see it? Uh, did we not? Should don't you think we should have devoted more time about the? the Hindu revivalists uh, from freedom struggle to post-independence. Did, did we ignore as a history, in our historiography, uh, if you look at collectively all the books? So, so if, if I may kind of reinterpret your question, what you're asking is, what could historians have done earlier to so, or what would, or what could media have done earlier or what the people the have history, been, uh, uh, done more in-depth studies about, let's say, the revivalists like Madan Mohan Malvi or Sam Prasad Mukherjee or Pan, uh, Tandan, these kind of people. And if we had, from there we could have realized, since they would have a premonition that this is what is in the store, yeah. rather than getting caught off guard in 2014. No, thank you again for uh, ma naming these people because that helps me to answer a question in a different way. I think it's very important for all of us not to put all these people in the same category or paint them with the same brush. Now, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya may have been a revivalist, but he was never anti-Muslim. He was never anti-Muslim. He was a great believer in the Ramayana. He never said Babri Masjid should go. Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya had uh, Ramayana occasions, Ram, Ramayana Katha organized hundreds of places. Yes, he may have had some views that others may, others may disagree with. He was uh, an orthodox Hindu. Uh, even on untouchability, he had reservations, you know. But orthodoxy, traditional mindedness is one thing. But creating dislike of some other, that he never did. So I think 
Your question is a very important one. We must not only ask whether historians did a good enough job to identify looming threats or future threats, but that is a question also for statesmen, for politicians, for media, for educators, for administrators. Could we have done much more? What could we? So those are very great questions. But I think in addition to identifying, you might say, uh, the negative ideas flowing from a particular set of people, we should also see where the rest of us could have done better. Or, or the others that we admire who, who were not traditional, who were not orthodox, who were not very Hindu, say who were leftists, who were socialists or communists. Could they have done better? Don't communists need a good analysis on why they fail to see the caste factor? They fail to see the Hindu-Muslim question. And of course, this is happening all over the world, by the way, why this majoritarianism is, is gaining ground. Uh, so in, in finding answers to that very major question, we, we need not target only a particular set of people. Uh, you know, the Muslims getting uh, we, um, may be fascinated to uh, you know, IS and over some kind of radicalization, some reports we have seen. So how do you see, in, how, what would be the future of Indian Muslim uh, in the present scenario that you, you have spoken much about the, the hate Muslims, uh, you, uh, you know, of the principle or policy of some leaders of the current leadership. So how do you see the future of Indian Muslim? So the Indian Muslims must ask themselves uh, about their future. And you know, so actually, it is a very great sadness, uh, let's look at it, when so many Muslims in India feel that they have to remain quiet. I think for, the, for us who belong to the majority community, it is a very painful truth that while we are all here, we are the majority, we are powerful in every so many institutions, but these Muslims are obliged to remain quiet, very sad. However, if absolutely, if there were Muslims who would say that all of India are my responsibility, yes, I'm a Muslim. I may be proud of many things in Muslim history. I may object to some things in my people's history. But it's not just Muslims alone who are my responsibility. Every Indian is my responsibility. So whether it is Indians, whether it's Muslims, whether it is Hindus, each of us has to see how we can broaden our, our commitment so that our concern is not limited to my lot of people. Uh, so how has religion actually played a role in South India from, you know, from what I see uh, during the independence and before independence and post-independence? So uh, the response to religion has changed over time in different parts of the South and different ways in different parts of the South. Um, certainly Periyar and some of his immediate colleagues were very emphatic and clear and you might say sweeping in their rationalism, in their denunciation of what they call superstition, which sometimes included all forms of religion in their understanding. But that was always a limited group. And many people admired them. Now, one thing very important to know, especially about Periyar, that he should not be judged by his occasional utterances like Dravidastan or his occasional very strong and you might say, uh, yes, excessive, extreme remarks against Brahmins or, or Hindu gods and goddesses. Those were real. He made those remarks. And he, in fact, he lost a lot of popularity as a result of those remarks, not just among the Brahmins, but among the bulk of the population also. Because the bulk of the population, as everywhere in the world, you know, there is the unknown, there is the danger, there are illnesses in the family. So you want to pray to somebody for some succor, some relief. So uh, temples have always existed and always will exist, and mosques and churches. And uh, so, but a very important part of the Dravidian movement, you know, these things that I quoted, the, this, these lines, 2,000 years old lines, 
so and compassion. So Tiruvalluvar and the other ideas of compassion have been articulated in the South, not just from the, uh, you might say, the Brahmin scholars or from the traditional Hindu texts, but also from, of course, Shaivite and Vaishnavite, but also the Buddhist and Jain texts. But many of these, you might say, non-sectarian ideas of goodwill and compassion and tolerance have had their a life of their own in the South for a very long time. And they have been a, a very great bulwark of the Dravidian movement also. You know, who has been uh, above all responsible for Thiruvalluvar's, whatever it is? You know, the Dravidian leaders. And, and you read Thiruvalluvar, he is absolutely fantastic. So in terms of morality, goodwill, compassion, the lack of a what others would see as the traditional Hindu forms of worship has not destroyed religion or the religious values in the South. Uh, a sort of a follow-up thing to what uh, Adi said. Yeah. Um, in, uh, you, we have known uh, the Dravidian movement and the Congress as some kind of uh, polar opposites, opposites in the uh, in the freedom struggle and later. But a very uh, distinctive part of your book is also about the points when there have been rapprochement between the two. You talk of Rajaji's friendship with uh, EVR. You talk of how, uh, how uh, EVR was almost a sort of a mentor to, uh, Kam, uh, to Kamraj. Uh, so uh, a little, if you could talk yes. about it the perception of a complete uh, clash between the Congress uh, on the one hand, the, the Dravidians on the other. But that is not, was not the case. Apart from this personal relationship that EVR and Rajaji maintained till the end. In, incredible story of uh, EVR's marriage and how he wanted to involve Rajaji in it. Uh, it's, uh, I won't reveal all the details, but it's there. But Kamraj was a great bridge between the Congress and the Dravidian movement. That is something to understand. And, uh, and of course, uh, Anadare and Rajaji formed a very strong alliance. Uh, and again, to go back to Thiruvalluvar, Rajaji, who translated the Kural into English, a wonderful, uh, one of the early translations, Karunanidhi, Anadare, EVR, they're all devotees of Tiruvalluvar. So there are great common grounds. Yes, they have bitter clashes. And of course, uh, when the DM DK did not actively support the freedom movement, that became another major. Uh, and when the DK also had conversations with uh, Jinnah, so that became another partition. So those were divisive issues, but there has been a, there, there have been lots of contacts between these different groups, and it isn't as if there is a kind of permanent irrevocable clash at all. Would you like to reflect upon the the society in 2014, which created the space for this political change to happen? Like, I mean. Uh, Pratabhanu Mehta uh, wrote a long essay some time back, I wonder if you read it. I mean, um, this inversion that you see, you know, somebody is being lynched on the road and people are actually sympathizing with the killers rather than with the guy who's sort of begging for his life. He says this is the age of cretinism which is upon us. You know that uh, Dalits have been lynched, are being lynched every week in all parts of India have been lynched for decades and decades and decades. So uh, what has happened in recent years is, is very, very tragic and very shameful, but it isn't as if it was unknown in India. So Indian society has had its quota of uh, horrible deeds for, for a long, long time. It has also had amazing quota of, of gallant and noble heroic deeds. But so much does depend on, on the lead that is given or not given. 
you know, this is, of course, as all of us have felt over the last four or five years. In Jawaharlal Nehru's time, if anything like this had happened, Jawaharlal Nehru would have rebuked the whole nation publicly and spoken about it, shamed the people concerned. If that were done today, instead of complete silence, even without that, isn't it amazing that so many police officers still do their duty, so many judges do their duty? This man in Buran Shahar was killed the other day about the casual conversation where prejudice and hatred and dislike and venom is revealed. Yes, I, I, that, I, that is a very important point. It is happening in many parts of the world also, by the way. Let's uh, realize that. In the uh, US, where I've spent much of my time, uh, exactly the same thing is happening. It's amazing the overlapping and even coincidence of the uh, curve of, of Trump and there and Modi here. It's quite, quite interesting. And the popular responses to those things. And uh, so, so the white America must take the country back. Uh, Hindu India must take the country back. So non-white Americans, not Americans, non-Hindus are not Indians, that kind of putting it very simply. So it's happening in many parts of the world. But it, wait, uh, we, reflected, we saw this reflected also in the way the media behaved. But even in the last two or three days, have you not observed how even some of the media has changed its tune in the headlines that, that have come? So we do take color from what is happening. And we want to be on the successful side, the victorious side. And so don't judge every person you meet who makes a horrible remark on the basis of that remark. I think this is very important. Because even those who make these negative remarks, and these wounding remarks that really upset us, they also have another side to them. If only we were to discover that other side. So uh, I think we have to be very firm as far as our own views are concerned, but far more charitable with, uh, with others. I think every citizen has a right to correct falsifications of history. Even in conversations, when people say, did this happen, it's a horrible thing happened, you know. Uh, no, no, it did not happen. I think that's the, that citizens must uh, educate and correct each other when false uh, remarks are made, which can lead to further division and further problems. And of course, the greater responsibility devolves on the historian. A historian should be able to provide uh, alternatives, uh, not necessarily to counter, counter what is said, which also is often necessary, but to provide histories which can preempt the other kind of, uh, you might say, poison spreading history. And, and by the way, this is again completely departing from all our discussion, the book, all that. The unemployment amongst our young, the biggest, biggest problem all the millions leaving the villages wanting to, all of India wants to settle in Bombay or Delhi. It cannot happen. What is our answer to that? This is a discussion on what historians should do or what citizens who should become historians should do. But what about thinking citizens coming together to see how we can find some employment for these millions and millions and millions of young people? Where is the thinking, the planning? Uh, the discussion, the dialogue, the passion for that. And, and when we, if we get that, and that's what people of India should be discussing. Why should it be the job just of a few elected leaders to remove unemployment in India? It should be the job of every citizen to contribute to it, to make villages uh, more habitable, more attractive. Um, so those are... Uh, those are some of the things that, uh, that I wrestle with. I don't have the answers, but I do feel that that is the kind of discussion that should take place on a, on a wider scale. And I'm sure all of us would have gone back with a lot of things to think about after this. <laughs> well, thank you for being so patient and allowing me to speak at length. <laughs>